So if you're just joining us, you are here for Retrospective of the Red with our very talented archivist April Anderson and newly retired Barb Ballinger. So you are in the right spot. I'm going to just give it a little bit longer, see if some more folks hop in. I am Stephanie Duquesne. I am with the Alumni Engagement Office, and I'm, we are excited to be hosting this event tonight during our 2022 Celebrate the Red Homecoming Week. Hope you all are having a happy homecoming. Welcome, people are coming in. Alrighty, we're getting a few more in. If you're just joining us, you are here for Retrospective of the Red with April Anderson and Barb Dallinger. We're gonna get started in just a little bit. Waiting for a few more folks. We're so excited that you're here with us. Homecoming 2022 has kicked off. We're right in the middle of the week. Looking forward to the rest of the week. Great, great plans for the next few days. Weather is looking a little bit okay on Saturday. Um, cross my fingers for no rain and maybe that the weather will pick up a little bit in temperature, but I think we're gonna do great. All right, well, it's 6.32 and I'm a prompt event planner. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Like I said, I'm Stephanie Duquesne, one of the senior directors for alumni engagement here at Illinois State University. And I'm so excited to have you all here tonight um, to listen in on why are we red and white? I actually don't know the answer to this. So I'm super excited to learn along with you. So let me introduce our panelists tonight. Um, many of you probably already know these two wonderful women, um, but first let me introduce Barb Dallinger. Barb Dallinger is a Central Illinois native. She received both her bachelor's in music education and master's of science in education in college student personnel administration from Illinois State University. She recently retired from Illinois State after working here for 30 years, starting in the College of Fine Arts and moving to various positions in the Division of Student Affairs, including University Housing, Campus Dining Services, the Bone Student Center, Braden Auditorium, and Event Management Dining and Hospitality. Her love of the university history started out as a graduate school assignment, which grew into various campus history presentations across campus. Her advice to campus visitors is to always Take the time to read the rocks. A rich story of dedication to our students is sure to unfold. So please help me welcome Barb Dallinger to the panel. Hello. Hey, hi, Barb. Hi. We're so excited you're here. This is your hey, first, thanks for your asking. first, your first like volunteer job for me post retirement. It, it, it won't it be the last. It will not <laughs> be the last. So now let's uh, help me welcome April Anderson Zorn. April is a university archivist for Illinois State University. Anderson Zorn earned her master's degree in library and information science from Florida State University in history from the University of Central Florida. She is a certified archivist through the Academy of Certified Archivists and holds a digital archive specialist certificate through the Society of American Archivists. April Anderson Zorn has also worked as an archives consultant, partnering with many academic institutions and companies to help set up their archives programs. That's always a difficult bio for me to read. How did I do this time? <laughs> you said archivist. <laughs> I say, am I saying it correctly? Oh, that's how I say it. There's there's a okay. very, very heated debate in our community. Is it archivist or archivist? And I'm in the oh, archivist I think, camp. So. I think you've taught me well. So oh, yeah. it's archivist in my book. <laughs> All righty. Well, welcome, April and Barb. We are going to, I'm going to take myself off camera. I'm going to let you drive this ship. Um, uh, folks that have joined us, please drop your questions into the Q&A. Barb and April will get to them when they see them. If we don't get to them, I'm going to hop back in towards the end and I will field those questions to Barb and April. So throughout this, this program, don't hesitate to, to throw any questions that might come up into that. And we're going to make sure we get um, those Q&A questions uh, answered um, by the time we hop off tonight. So without further ado, Barb and April, have a great, great time. 
Thanks, Stephanie. I'm going to share my screen. Let's make sure everybody can see that screen. Looks like Yay. you can see it. All right. And I'm going to pull up my presentation window on the other end. Soups, and let me move this over here. All right, you know, technology, what can I say? <laughs> so thanks, Stephanie, for the intros. And thanks again to the Alumni Association for inviting uh, Barb and I back. Gosh, what is this, like four years, five years we've been doing this, Barb? Yeah. Oh, song and dance. Yeah, <laughs> so we've been doing this a while. So welcome to Retrospective of the Red, the history of ISU school colors, or what we like to commonly refer to ourselves as the Barb and April show. So we hope that you uh, will learn a lot from us, have a lot of fun with us, and we love that you're joining us for what we think is going to be a fun and really informative discussion. And also real quick, this is my chance to plug uh, the exhibit, the companion exhibit to this that's over at Milner Library uh, on, on display right now. Uh, it's a, a photograph panel exhibit that's located in the Milner Cafe. So if you're unfamiliar, uh, come in off of the off of the plaza, take a left in the cafes there and in the cafe on the wall, there are panels that talk about the thing we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, and it's up through November 4th. So uh, without further ado, let me hop it over to Barb and take it away, Barb. Thank you. So a lot of people know that we were founded February 18th, 1857 as the Illinois State Normal University. But what a lot of people don't realize is we didn't hold classes in Old Main right away. It took three years for us to actually get into the Old Main building. Our first classes were held downtown Bloomington in what was called at that time, Majors Hall. So the new building, Old Main, was set to be built. Was that, is that like Majors Hall? That is Majors Hall after it had its third floor removed. And this came from the Library of Congress. Woo, so wow. yeah, yeah. The, the earlier image were, were the blueprints, the floor plans, and this is Majors Hall after it suffered a fire and the third floor was removed. And I wanna say this is <clears throat> sometime in the late, 40s, don't hold me to that. But yeah, what this is the with us and fire. We don't have good luck with fire. We we typically don't. No, most wow. most, most structures Crazy. don't. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, the the university was built in what was then called North Bloomington mm -hmm. because the normal wasn't here yet, right? North mm -hmm. Bloomington, and it was going to be a three story tall building plus this little clock tower there on the top, which consider that it's out there in the middle of what used to be called a muddy cornfield of mush. And this would rise up grandly and make such a statement that the people would think it was this wonderful grand building. Funding issues and construction delays from the panic from 1857 delayed that. It delayed the ability to start it. So we did wind up going into what Illinois State Normal University, mm -hmm. right in time for that first class of students to be able to graduate three years later, because you did, you graduated in three years. And there's a picture that really shows how large that building was. Mm -hmm. And if you look down where this little row of trees, I'm pointing like you can see me, this little row of trees down here, you can see the little building down there. Let's see if I can. It was built close to, oh, there you go. It was built close to that at the time for the ease of transportation and things because that was the train station that we now affectionately call the Uptown Mass Transportation Center. So that was a little handy dandy reason for that to be there. But this building, it held it all. It held the classrooms, it held the labs, it held the offices. It held everything that was supposed to be needed for that university and it even contained a natural history museum. And it was known nationally as one of the best natural history <laughs> museums in the Midwest, which is quite impressive, but this is a building that would then later become to be known as Old Main. The distinctive, it was a distinctive feature around campus and the local community, because you have to imagine at the beginning, there was nothing until you came to Illinois Westland. It was just like, corn and grass and things on the way. So the most distinctive feature of this building, the clock tower was painted white. You can tell it was rather ornate. And it was described in the 1882 book 
a history of Illinois State Normal University by ISNU alum and the Philadelphia Literary Society President M. I. Morgan recalled a red and white Brussels, that is a Brussels carpet that was purchased in secret and presented to one of the clubs. And the grandest of enterprises, author Helen Marshall noted that it was a beautiful building, everyone agreed, and it seemed to rise out of the prairie in the red and white grandeur. So we have all the red brick and the white top and all the white trim. Um, the thing that surprised me when April and I started working on this was, I mean, as silly as it sounds, I had never seen a colored picture at Bold Maine. Everything was black and white. So I had no clue when this first picture from the presentation came up, I was like, oh my gosh, that's Old Maine in color. I don't know how to look at the quad back in that day in color. It was always in black and white. So this, it was very impressive, I'm sure at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, the the building, um, as many ISU historians over the years have have frequently talked about, the building was just one of the largest buildings that had been built in this area and could be seen for miles and miles and miles across the prairie. And it was this red bricked, white topped building. Um, that, as as Helen Marshall says, rose out of the prairie in the red and white grandeur. So, so we're setting the stage. I think you see where this argument's going, but we've got more evidence for you. <laughs> so <laughs> with that, um, I'm going to take it over for a second and talk about literary societies. So Barb already alluded uh, to literary societies, but do any of you, if you think about this for a minute, do any of you remember a time in your, your educational pursuits, a time when athletics just wasn't a thing? When you were, say, in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, when there just were no athletics? And, and you don't, <laughs> because athletics currently is built into the very fabric of our campus life. And, and here at ISU, particularly when we were ISNU, it was taught as a core component of educational pursuits as far back as the start of the university where you were taking these courses to learn how to teach a particular athletic pursuit or how to teach physical education. So it's it's definitely built into the fabric of our being. Um, but but that's, that's the educational side of athletics. What about competitive athletics, okay? So we're kind of just looking particularly at competitive athletics. And, and frankly, we just, we just didn't have those <laughs> at the start of the university. What we did have were literary societies. Um, and what, I know you're, you're like, April, come on, literary societies and athletics, that's not the same thing. They, they, there's no, come on, you, you, like there's sports, right? You, there's hitting a ball with a baseball bat, there's throwing a football, there's basketball, there's, there's running track, like that's not the same thing. Well, they would argue with you back in the day uh, with literary societies. Um, you grew up with competitive baseball, football, soccer, volleyball, and all those other sports that we all love in your educational life. So, of course, not having that and, and hearing that literary societies were themselves competitive seems a little, little silly, but they certainly took it very seriously at the start of the university. So having said that, uh, let's go to the beginning and talk about the very first week of classes in 1857 in Majors Hall. So those images that you just saw of Majors Hall. Um, the very first week, the students, the the dozen or more so of students that were there, well, dozen and then, you know, and then a few extra, um, they came together and they wanted to discuss literature, arts, advancements in science and medicine, and, and just have a space for friendly debate among peers and colleagues. And the way that they did this was they formed a debating society, very popular to do in the day. So they came together, they have the space to do uh, these discussions and debates, and it only lasted about a year. <laughs> it hit a snag after about a year. As we understand it in archives, this is, so I'm going to give you the how we know it and what it probably was. Um, as we understand it, um, there was a disagreement between members within the normal debating society um, about presidential powers, what a president of the group could or couldn't do. And it forced this group to split. So what we got were, uh, here we go, the Philadelphians. And this is from uh, one of the earlier yearbooks that we have. Um, and this is just a stylized logo of Philadelphia or the Philadelphians. So if you're like, Philadelphians, why do they call themselves the Philadelphians? Well, they wanted to show support for the society's president, 
So they named themselves after the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Philadelphians. Get it? <laughs> yeah. so, I know, right? The Wrightonians. Let me pull them up real quick. The Wrightonians. Here we go. There's their stylized Ooh. logo. The Wrightonians were the opposing side who who did not think that the president of the debate so, debating society needed to have as many powers as they had at the time, and so they named themselves after an ISU Board of Education member, Simeon Wright. So Wrightonians, ha ha ha, uh, and Simeon Wright supported them in their beliefs. Well. I don't want you to, don't let this disagreement at all fool you because they got along just fine. After they split into the two groups, uh, they came together frequently and debated and had yearly annual contests and little mini contests where they would uh, compete for little awards. And at the annual contest every year, they would compete for a trophy for best literary society. So this was probably just uh, an excuse to split into two teams for them to have competition. And it was just that catalyst for the debates that they eventually had. Uh, so these competitions included paper presentations, debates on national and international topics, music, theater, they performed the pieces that they created, you name it, they did it. Uh, and they and they did this frequently and heavily. And so when you started at the university, you were placed into one of these two groups. You didn't have a choice. You were just put in to the Philadelphians or the Wrightonians. Oh. Yeah, you didn't, you had to do it. And when I say you had to do it, you didn't necessarily, you weren't forced to, to sing a song that you wrote. You weren't at an annual contest. You didn't have to do that, but you did definitely, you, you had to show up. You did definitely need to show up uh, and show support for uh, your group. If not, it was kind of a social shun, right? You needed to show up. So uh, they also had their own school colors or excuse me, their own group colors, I should say. Um, and the Philadelphians, and I want to show you a real quick picture of Philadelphia Hall. This is Philadelphia Hall in Old Main, that big, beautiful building we were just talking about. Uh, the society colors for the Philadelphians were orange and black. So you can kind of think of and see this black and white picture decked out in the orange and black of their society colors. And then the Wrightonians uh, colors, and this is, you can Ooh. kind of see in that archway, you can kind of see their name, Wrightonians. Uh, their colors were purple and gold. So they were always decked out in purple and gold. And as it, oops, sorry, I went way too far. Let me go back. There we go. Uh, and as a quick side note, the, the libraries for these literary societies, the Wrightonians and the Philadelphians, those two libraries, along with three other libraries on campus, formed the initial university library in 1888 that was, um, that was first founded, frankly, by Angeline Vernon Milner. I had to get my library my library stats in there for you. <laughs> I can't not do these and not talk about the library. Um, so, and we're, Barb is going to talk about this a little bit more here in a bit, but the university didn't have colors really until the 1890s. So these literary societies who have these colors and are using colors as their sort of spirit rah, 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 um, they were the ones that were starting to lay the foundation for school support and, and using these logos and these images um, and, and ways of do, doing that for school support and showing what that could be. Um, and if you're asking, well, April, we don't have these anymore. What happened to them? Um, in the early 20th century, we started to see the addition of competitive sports to the university. So literary societies and the favor for literary societies started to fall out. And membership became voluntary. You didn't, you weren't automatically signed up. The increase in student population, it's just, that was the way of it. And then by, by 1952, the groups had both disbanded and there were no more annual contests, but we were obviously very deep into school colors and we were the Redbirds, spoiler alert, we were the Redbirds by that point. Um, but we had already developed that sense of school pride and using these elements in order to express our school pride. So um, from the... Oh yeah, go ahead. From the like the student affairs type of the world, we talk about this being very much a predecessor almost to Greek lights. Yes, and very much. One, things, yeah. When one group gets a rug, the other one has to get a piano. And then all of a sudden <laughs> we both have to have a piano, that competitive spirit with Greek yeah. life. But the other thing student affairs that we find interesting in the land of student affairs mm -hmm. is that classes started and it only took them until Wednesday to say, what are we going to do with them Saturday night? We need what are we going to do with them on the weekend? Yeah, yeah. And thus, all of us on the land of student affairs, and what, what do we do to keep you busy and out of trouble? 
<laughs> yeah. What do we do then? I say bring back the literary societies, but that's, you know, that's that me. would that would possibly do a better trick now. <laughs> that is very, very true. So let me flip it over. Barb's going to talk like a, like I teased earlier. She's going to talk a little bit about those early calls by ISNU students, ISNU students for having school colors. So take it away, Barb. Ooh, okay. So in early 1893, here we see after a fierce battle for literary dominance <laughs> between the Philadelphians and the Wrightonians, ISU students contemplated the adoption of school colors. In an op-ed in the January 1893 issue of Bidette, which I believe we see here, mm -hmm. um, one student reflected on using the colors to promote the campus literary societies. And it looked like they took, President Cook took a group of students to Champaign, now known as the University of Illinois, the State University, but now known as University of Illinois, mm -hmm. to tour an educational laboratory and it sounded like there were other groups of students there too. And each group appeared to have their own colors. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a little bit of a, why don't we, why don't we yeah. have our own school colors? So this is where a little bit of the discrepancy kind of comes in. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in oh, real quick. No, no, yeah, no, no. no. Um, so in 1893, in that op-ed, um, the the students were were kind of complaining well everybody else that comes to play us has colors why don't we but it's not mentioned again in any of our literature at all until that fateful that you mentioned john cook taking a group of our students to uiuc um the state university at the time uh in february of 1894 and we were already wearing our school colors and it was mentioned in the vedette that each member and it's in this little this little article clip right here each member of the party, our party, wore our school colors, cardinal and cream. So this is the first time that the university had reported in any way the adoptions of school gotcha. colors. Mm -hmm. Everyone was at his best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put up for you the 1894 yearbook. Yeah. Okay. So later that year in the yearbook, the university officials adopted the school colors, though the colors had already changed in just a year. The yearbook reported university colors as first adopted, red and white. Colors are now called cream and crimson. Crim <laughs> crimson. In just a year, ISNU's colors went from cardinal and cream to red and white, and then cream and crimson. Although the official names of the colors changed, the colors themselves stayed relatively the same. And then by 1923, we were starting to take on a whole new meaning with mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. So this is a copy here of the University Yells. Mm -hmm. And by the 1900s, Illinois State Norman University was for the most part the red and white. Mm -hmm. However, they struggled to find a mascot to wear those colors and lead the charge. Yeah. So in the early 1900s, sports writers for the Vedette used several nicknames to describe our teachers. And that is just a interesting little early Reggie there. I have <laughs> and always taken a little aback by that. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. They used several nicknames that we're seeing here. The Fighting Teachers was so popular that the Vedette used it in November of 1921 to highlight a hard fought football game. And in 1922, the Vedette referred to the normal football players as the Fighting Pedagogues mm -hmm. against an in town rival, Illinois Wesleyan. The nickname stuck, as did the moniker Fighting Teachers. However, a consistent nickname and mascot had yet to be discovered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I just want to point out, uh, some people don't know what a pedagogue is, and I honestly didn't know what the heck a pedagogue is. Um, it, it's, it's short for pedagogy. So we taught pedagogy, which is the philosophy of teaching, and we taught pedagogy since day one at the university. And so all these sports writers in the area are trying out these different monikers of the fighting 
blah, blah, blah. Teachers, normalites, pedagogues. Pedagogues by far did not stick, <laughs> but they, yeah. by God, they tried. They tried a few times and, yeah. and you know, they were given it a whirl. I love that. The fighting teachers, wow. <laughs> yeah. The top of the vignette. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm still kind of wondering who we are, where we're going. Mm -hmm. And in the early 1920s, a four-legged contender for the INU, SNU mascot leapt onto the scene. A stray dog, later named Wahoo, or Wahoo, like <laughs> Wahoo at the game, by the students, first found friendly ear scratches from the residents of Bell Hall. He could be found lounging by the residence hall or in the steps of Old Main. Students regularly snuck him into, his, into their rooms and fed him food, spirited from the dining location. Some enterprising students even created a red blanket with ISNU stitched on one side for Wahoo to wear at athletic events. Known to chase cars away from Fell Hall, Wahoo met an untimely fate in January of 2023 when he was hit by a passing vehicle. Now, seriously, were the cars going that fast then? Well, you know, I mean, the cars cars aren't a feather, so <laughs> it could That's be. True. You know. like, seriously? Yeah. The campus went into mourning and later dedicated a page to the pup in the 1924 yearbook. Though the nickname Red Birds was already chosen, Wahoo remained the official mascot of ISNU for many 1920 students. And do we think that's what he looked like? Oh, let me go back. I'll show you. Um, uh, yes, that that is that is an uh, artistic rendering of Wahoo for the 1924 yearbook. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So then in 1923, ISNU Athletics Director Clifford Pop Horton, Horton Fieldhouse, Ford Fieldhouse, began referring to ISNU athletes as the Cardinals. He saw a natural fit with the bird in the school colors. However, the Daily Pentagraph sports editor, Fred Young, pointed out that there were already Cardinals in the area the St. Louis Cardinal baseball team, and they were perhaps not thrilled with that. <laughs> After some collaboration, Redbirds was settled on. When asked about a nickname in later years, Horton fully credits Young for the name, though both worked to find a suitable fit. The name was slow to catch on to the ISNU fans and sport writers, and many still referred to ISNU as the many nicknames they'd come to embody over the years. Mm -hmm. However, by the 1930s, not only did Red Birds take flight, the name became Red Birds. So it went from Cardinals to Red Birds two words to Red Bird one word. And that is a dashing Reggie there. That is uh, an example of one of the many Reggies around that era that, that frequently molted. <laughs> we had stories from, from past or from alumni, from past students who who yeah. played the red bird and talked about the red bird molting. <laughs> that was one of them. <laughs> the end of the homecoming parade. Yeah, yeah. He's a little sparse. <laughs> um, thanks. All right, thanks, Barb. I'm gonna kick it over to today's red and white. So, mm -hmm. um, as as we were just mentioning, the university had started to embrace the official school colors of red and white. So event decorations, uniforms, your athletics gear, all these things, including the mascot, started to feature some of these school colors that we were embracing at this point. So the colors remained relatively consistent throughout the decades. The look of the red bird, as you see in these photos, <laughs> as you've seen so far, did not. <laughs> the students, um, particularly students that were living over in Tri Towers, were taking up the responsibility of creating and wearing uh, the mascot uniform and going to athletics, generally athletics games, um, and uh, participating in those events in these uniforms that they created themselves. 
Um, while some costumes, obviously, some of these are very well crafted, others suffered from paint chips. And as I was just mentioning in one instance, um, there was molting during a basketball game. Um, or one, one uh, we'll call former Redbird told me about the time that they were sitting there in a chair and there was nothing they could do. And the feathers just kept, just kept falling off and they kept stopping the basketball game to sweep up the feathers because there was just nothing they could do. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so by 1981, we get this guy. We get Reggie. Ooh. Reggie is officially named. Uh, he is named after baseball legend Reggie Jackson by the Junior Redbird Club. They came up with that. Uh, so then, then since the school colors have been incorporated into, or excuse me, since then school colors have been incorporated into several uh, traditions through the years. We have seen them in uh, various Redbird spirit groups. Some of you may have participated in some of these bleacher cards. Um, I've seen this called a couple of different things, but bleacher cards uh, seen or bleacher card section, I think, is what I see most frequently when I see these various card pictures. Um, so lots of Redbird, Redbird spirit groups. Uh, we also see oh here's another one here's a really great photo of just Yay. you know right it's just a fun photo of, of wearing the red and the white at a game um but you're also seeing the red and white incorporated into uh into events into scheduled events like wear red on friday um that we still promote to this day uh wear red on friday was something that was uh started by the redbird pride committee in the 2000s to spread pride and spirit for isu uh, some of you may be familiar with red alert which is the official student group of illinois state university athletics and they create limited limited edition clothing each year for students, faculty, and fans. Uh, the color is even used to name campus services like, hey, library shout out, ISU Red, <laughs> which is the ISU uh, institutional depository for, uh, uh, for material that's created by faculty, students, and staff here on campus. Oh. Um, and things like the annual red and white football scrimmage game, obviously there are school colors attached to that. And we put it with scholarships like the red and white student scholarship fund that supports students in times of need. So if you'll allow me, Barb, I'm gonna bring it full circle real quick. So- oh, absolutely. Thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask everybody. So we've we've given you some some points to ponder, some evidence here. So let's ask the big question: Was the inspiration for the red and white tied to Old Maid? Well, I'm gonna give you some things that I think are gonna check the yes column quite a bit. So first, we have what Barb mentioned at the top are Helen Marshall's and other ISU uh, history professors and ISU uh, uh, historians who have talked at great length about Old Main and what Old Main looked like. But I point out specifically Helen Marshall because everybody knows knows the grandest of enterprises. If you are an ISU historian scholar, you know the grandest of enterprises. And I have these two quotes that I pulled out in particular because I think, I think Helen um, words it well. And she says at the top, with trees, flowers, shrubs, and lawn, and the magnificent building of red brick topped with a white tower and dome, the campus would be a joy to behold. So she really points out here, the red brick and the white tower of Old Main. She also says later in the book, uh, referring to Old Main, it was a beautiful building, everyone agreed. It seemed to rise out of the prairie. So leading back to this ginormous building on the prairie, rising out of the prairie in red and white grandeur. Uh, someday above that silvery dome, a flag would float and a bell would ring out. Ah, okay, well, <laughs> so it's a little, a little bit flowery there, but I think she makes the point once again, this frankly uh, storied building, and I don't mean that as a, it's got stories to it. I mean, as in a legendary building that was meant to be grandiose on the prairie, that was the building for ISNU. And she really points that out. Um, another check in the yes column uh, is that it was the very first building on the ISNU campus. And when I say the very first building, yes, all right, there was a, a small heating facility that was built prior to it becoming a thing. They needed the, the heating facility for Old Main. But Old Main was the first and only building to be on this campus until Cook Hall was built in the late 1890s. This was ISNU. This was referred to frequently and only as 
that is Illinois State Normal University. It wasn't a classroom building. It wasn't the administration building. It was Illinois State Normal University. If someone in town needed directions, go to Illinois State Normal University. That was that building. So it was referred to by the name of the institution that it was housing, that it was educating. And lastly, I think the most important thing here, the alumni, the alumni who I can still sometimes find people who remember walking the halls of Old Main. Yeah. There are many generations of students who learn <coughs> their craft, who I maybe heard some stories of some students living in there. Uh, they, you know, <laughs> laughed in the building. They loved in that building. They found passions, whether in people or places or what they were doing. There are so many people in our various family circles that remember walking its halls. So it's only natural, I think, that the red and the white would originate from a building that meant so much and was so beloved by so many generations of redbirds. So uh, that that is the ultimate argument that we make tonight to you. And I hope that you agree that Old Main's, the, the, the inspiration, and you can kind of see it in this, in this, uh, this postcard, the inspiration for the red and the white. And there's our contact information. Please, if you have any questions, um, you can ask it here. If you would like to email us separately, we're always happy to uh, to talk separately. And you know, Barb and I, the Barb, the Barb and April show, <laughs> we're always happy to put on a show and talk river history with you. Always. Well, thank you both so much. It's always such a joy to hear from you. And every single time I <laughs> learn so much from you too, and I can share that with my alums that come back and weekends such as homecoming, um, but also my students. I love um, quizzing my students and teaching them about fun facts about ISU and, you know, the more they know. We got uh, one question here for you all. So you mentioned a train station at the beginning. Uh, yeah. The main train station was in Bloomington, but was there an early one in Normal? It was called the Junction. and it was at that time it was called the junction where the train like it would stop to drop things off but it wasn't where you were maybe gonna hop on the train you know what i mean but by the time abraham lincoln passed away it was because that was where the students all went to watch his train as it went by and also where the students used to, the students who worked in the dining halls used to make sack lunches for the soldiers as they went through town on the way to war. And they would go out to that train station and pass out sack lunches to the soldiers on the trains. And that was, that was what the John Green Scholarship was founded from because John Green was so impressed wow. by the work the students did feeding the boys as they were on their way to war. So I'm not sure it was to the extent of the one in Bloomington, having ridden the Bloomington one when I was a little kid, but it was at least a stopping point with the little, the little X and ding, ding, ding on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I hope that makes well, sense. Well, it makes perfect sense. Um, and I didn't even know that. I got little chills when you're talking about John Green. <laughs> well, we don't have any other questions. so. Um, we can pop off a reminder to those that um, are attending. I did record this, so we will, we can send a recording to you if you request it. Also, I'll be posting it on our virtual site that is right off of our alumni.ilsu.edu site. has all of our virtual programs. So if you missed one of uh, Barb and April's historical tours that we took last year, they're on there. So uh, you could take a look at those along with some other virtual, great virtual events that we've been doing since. 2020. So thank you all. I hope to see many of you back on campus as we celebrate the red for homecoming 2022. Have a great night. Thank you.